I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, town hall on uh, racial equality, this conversation uh, on race. Uh, I'm Jacob Solomon, privileged to serve as the president and CEO of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. Um, we are uh, joined uh, by a lot of people, which is really very heartening. Uh, we have nearly 500 people signed up for this evening's session, which is indicative of, of just how, um, how concerned, how interested, and how important our community uh, feels about this issue. Um, we, we got started a little late because uh, with so many people, uh, we had to clear everyone through the, um, through the waiting room uh, for security to make sure that only registered guests joined us. And I'm sure that the rest of the uh, people who signed up will be, will be coming along uh, momentarily. I, I wanna begin by uh, really by uh, welcoming and thanking our current board chair, uh, Jeff Sheck, our incoming board chair, Ike Fisher, our community relations chair, Tracy Spiegelman, um, for their support in doing uh, this program. Um, we have um, scores of Federation board members joining us this evening. Uh, I'm proud of Federation leadership and, and colleagues for supporting and encouraging this gathering. Um, I, I think that uh, I think the, the issue uh, speaks for itself. Uh, the fact that we have so many people signed up though is, is a good indication that our community cares deeply. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us. On, on May 31st, the Federation issued a statement denouncing the brutal murder of George Floyd at the hands of police officers while he was handcuffed and helpless on the ground pleading for his life. The death is yet another in a shockingly long list of similar incidents and ex inexcusable injustices that have been perpetrated against African Americans across the United States. The statement called on people of all races, ethnic backgrounds, religions, to speak up against systemic racism that is a longstanding disgrace for which we all must share. The reaction from the Jewish and general communities to this statement was immediate and very heartening. And I should note, it reflected the polls that we've seen that demonstrate that this issue transcends politics and party with strong support from all quarters of the Jewish community, from the general community, and from the African-American community. I wanna share though, this for me at least personally, what was most profound was the reaction from my colleagues at Federation, from our, our Federation staff. As you might expect, we have a diverse, very diverse staff at Federation. And the responses that we got from our black colleagues was painful, but so important to hear. The stories that they shared of personal attacks, the apprehension they feel as their sons go out for what should be an innocent evening with friends, or the terror in their bones when they read about the last or the next Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, or George Floyd. They shared their pain with us, and they also shared their pride in our statement for speaking out. They felt supported, they felt loved, and, and they are. Friends, we approach this issue with years of experience working in common cause with local African-American community leaders on issues of mutual concern. And as Jews, we also approach this issue with a personal and painful recognition of the dangers of unchecked prejudice, particularly when that hatred becomes institutionalized within the power structures of society. But we don't approach this issue with any pride. We're convening this gathering with a great deal of humility, acutely aware that the beginning of any true relationship or true progress, that that, that starts with listening, to listen carefully, to understand what causes our fellow man and woman pain, to open our hearts to the realities that too many in our society must live with, and to let that knowledge sink in and motivate us to do better. Our tradition teaches us that all humans are created in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim, and it compels us not to stand idly by the blood of our neighbors. George Floyd should not have died. 
he, his family, African Americans everywhere, and all who have suffered as a result of discrimination and bigotry are entitled to equal treatment, to equal justice. They're entitled to raise their children free from hate and free from fear. That's what we want for our children, and we should want no less. We should insist on no less for theirs. This moment is an invitation, and the moment is urgent. It's an invitation to advance, to improve, to do better, to be better as individuals, as organizations, as communities, and indeed as a nation. I hope and pray that this gathering contributes in some small way toward that end. Um, let me go through a little bit of, of housekeeping as far as how the uh, program will go. Um, I know it's a source of frustration for many people probably, but you're all on mute. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you're gonna to need to stay on mute. Uh, if you have a question uh, for me or for any of the panelists though, what I'd ask you to do is click at the bottom of, the, of your screen where it says chat, and that will open the chat window on the right side of, of your screen. Uh, you probably all know that from being on countless Zoom calls over the last 14 weeks. Uh, type in your question, let me know who it's for, and without any promise that I'll get to it, because I'm sure there'll be more than we have time for, uh, I'll do the best I can to curate those questions and pass them along to our panelists. Um, the meeting is being recorded, uh, and it will be available, should you wish to listen to it after the fact, or if you think it's worth sending along to a friend, neighbor, or, or a family member. Um, we said an hour, um, uh, I'm not gonna count the delay, but uh, let's call that a goal and not a promise, um, but let's see how the evening goes. So first, let me, let me briefly introduce our, our panelists. And I wanna begin by saying these people who have uh, volunteered and offered to share some thoughts and wisdoms and perspectives with us are not strangers to us, they're friends, um, and, and we have a relationship with each one of them for which we're enormously grateful. Ruben Roberts is the CEO and founder of RER Consultant, Consulting, and he currently serves as the president of the Miami-Dade branch of the NAACP. He consults, trains, and supervises municipalities in the areas of strategic planning, business and job development, and criminal justice, improving police community relationships via cultural sensitivity and community engagement workshops, seminars, and training. He has spent 25 years working with disadvantaged youth and families mired in the juvenile justice system. He is a frequent participant and speaker at our events, and we're deeply grateful for the friendship we share. Dr. Shirley Planton. Dr. Planton is one of the heroes of our community. She's the executive director of the Miami-Dade County Community Relations Board, and she's also the chief executive consultant for U-Turn Youth Consulting Firm and, at, and an at-risk youth consultant who facilitates training around culturally sensitive topics. She's provided years of intervention and advocacy for youth and families dealing with complex institutions, such as Department of Juvenile Justice, Juvenile Assessment Center, Department of Children and Family, and Police Departments. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Shirley. Sherry Tsvi. Sherry joined ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, as the Florida Director in July of 2017. Throughout her career, Sherry's been dedicated to serving and strengthening the Florida Jewish community, fighting bigotry and anti-Semitism, and making the world a better place for all of us. She's the granddaughter of four Holocaust survivors and a first-generation American. She was proud to serve as the Southeast Regional Director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum before ADL, and before that, she served as a trusted and valuable member of the APAC staff, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. She's a good friend and a great partner, and we are grateful for both. Alvi Thompson, Jr. Alvi is a certified holistic lifestyle coach and teaches his clients how to optimize their physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health in order to maximize their life. We got to know Alvi when he participated in Federation's Network Leadership Development Institute. Network is our under 45 group of, of emerging leaders who are looking to increase their engagement with the local community. Alvi also participated on one of Miami's community birthright trips to Israel last summer, a 10 day journey for young adults to connect with their Jewish identity. 
And finally, my dear colleague at Federation, Carol Brick-Turin. Carol serves as the director of our public affairs arm, the Jewish Community Relations Council. She had a 30-year career in Washington, D.C., where she was also active in the Northern Virginia Jewish community. She served as a diplomat and worked in the public sector uh, with decision makers on both sides of the aisle before founding her own trade and political consulting firm. She serves as a member of the executive committee of the Miami-Dade County Community Relations Board and the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Policy Institute on Human Trafficking. She's also the past president of the National Community Relations Council Directors Association. We are indeed fortunate to be able to call on all of these people uh, as friends and as colleagues, and we're delighted that they will join us tonight to educate us, and I'm certain to inspire us. To start, we're gonna ask Ruben to lead off, and we've asked each of our panelists to make a few opening comments, responding to the following question. How are you processing recent events on a personal level and on an organizational level? What's the best that's come out of the community during these days? And what can we do better to navigate the waters ahead to a better place? So again, with, with deep thanks um, to the audience, if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and, um, and, and type them in. And I will um, do the best I can to um, to uh, get to those questions um, as we are able. So I believe I need to, um, there's Ruben, and can we hear you? Hello? We can, okay, you are on Ruben, welcome. Shalom, and thank you Jacob uh, for the great introduction, and I'd like to thank the Federation for uh, putting this together. I think it's so very important that we unite in times like these. and. I want to also thank the Federation uh, for sending out a letter uh, denouncing uh, the senseless murder of uh, George Floyd and also uh, the efforts of several organizations associated with the Federation responding to a recent op-ed that I wrote and saying, saying that you stand with us. Uh, it's good to know that you have friends and I consider all of you my friends. I've spoken at several uh, synagogues and past couple of weeks I was on the show today uh, with Rabbi Barar's uh, show and and I'm here now. It's good to know that you have friends that will stand publicly with you and I thank you all for standing publicly with us against hatred and racial uh, violence. Where I am now, if you all uh, I have a little bit of a social work background so uh, if you're familiar with Kubler-Ross and stages of grief. I'm in a stage of acceptance, finally. I am getting to a place to where I can accept. So the things that have happened, uh, not in a positive way, but accept it to know that I need to uh, encourage uh, folks to move on and, and talk about what, what are the next steps. So what we've experienced is this convergence of two pandemics. And we've experienced the pandemic of COVID-19 and, and and the pandemic of racial violence and police brutality. Uh, we have a history in this country, uh, African-Americans, Black people in this country of, of uh, not being seen as human. In fact, if you look at the Constitution and you know about the three-fifth compromise, uh, Black folks who were brought to this country were saw as three-fifths human, and uh, not until the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, that came uh, where those changes made. And so the thing that 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 is uh, challenging is that we're still dealing with issues that are over, you know, centuries, uh, years old. But the thing that is refreshing, the thing is that is most promising is that to see the wave or the sea of, of supporters of all races, all creeds, all colors, all ethnicity, um, to see the intergenerational uh, support of folks who are protesting nonviolently. Never have I ever seen so many people stand in support of a black man who was brutally murdered. Uh, so that is something that definitely brings me to that place of acceptance and uh, gives me a feeling of hope that our future 
is promising that we are moving in the direction now along with uh, state, uh, state, local, and federal level legislators that are putting reforms, uh, criminal justice reforms in place, that are looking to address the issues that we've been facing. And when I say we, I mean all of us, because if it happens to one human, all humans are affected. Any of you that have seen the videos of Ahmaud Arbery, of George Floyd, I don't know how you erase that those scenes from your memory. Those memories will, those, vi those visual images will stick with us forever. And for everyone that sees the, you know, the humanity in people, it's difficult to just, uh, um, you know, escape that. But the most important thing that I hope everyone takes from this is that we are all human and that we wanna be viewed and seen as human. Protesters are protesting because they feel that they had no voice. And now with the protests, they finally feel that they're being heard. And so I thank you for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thank, thank you very much, Ruben. And thanks for your great work in, in, in the community. We're, we're lucky to have you um, in a leadership role in, in Miami-Dade County. Uh, Shirley, would you um, give your thoughts in response to the uh, to the question, uh, both personally, organizationally, and where you hope it goes? So I first want to say thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for thinking of us as a partner, but more importantly, thank you for always extending your arm when we are in need um, of a partnership and a friendship. So first and foremost, I am the executive director of the Miami-Dade Community Relations Board. I normally don't speak for the board, um, as the chair of the board would be the one to speak. However, since we're speaking about programmatic issues, I am honored to speak for the CRB. CRB was created, often known, Miami-Dade Community Relations Board is um, often known as the CRB. We were created in 1963 by an ordinance specifically for the times such as this. Um, we were created with very specific mission to mitigate community tension as quick as possible, to bridge, uh, to create bridges of tolerance and mutual respect, but more importantly, um, to establish that understanding amongst communities within Miami-Dade County. I, I can honestly say thank you to, to the likes of Reuben Roberts who have created who serve as pioneers for us, right? Who say, this is how it should be done in the light of the work that he has done through the NAACP. Um, I consider myself honored to be in this position as a time such as this, because this is indeed history in the making. I echo 100% Ruben's sentiment that one of the things that we should definitely be able to take away is to see the likeliness of all of those that are marching with us, um, hand in hand, um, screaming and, and protesting against what should be a common sense issue. Um, so if I were to answer some of the questions, how am I processing? I am the mother of a six-year-old black boy. I am the wife of a black man and I am the daughter of a black man. So for me, I am in the process of trying to understand how do I navigate? I can give you a clear example. Sunday night, my husband went out with some friends and it, it went past midnight. And instantly I started to call. I started to make those phone calls. And when he didn't answer, all types of thoughts went through my mind. And one of the very same thoughts that went through my mind, what if he happens to be stopped by a police officer and what does that look like? Um, I can tell you that as a mother of a six-year-old, I'm trying to help him process what he's watching, right? What is he watching on the television? What are they protesting about? And when your six, seven-year-old son says to you, but I thought they were protesting the death of the guy and he shouldn't have died that way and the police officer shouldn't have treated him that way. And you find yourself having to have conversations about you know, still respecting law enforcement and the institution of law enforcement, but yet still having to have this conversation of what it looks like to be a young black man in America. It's a conversation that many parents are having um, albeit some are not ready to have, but we understand that there are conversations and Mr. Roberts can speak to this better than I. There are conversations that black fathers and black mothers have to have with their boys about surviving police interactions in, in, you know, in this country, surviving just being black 
in this country, particularly right now as parents are preparing to send many of their boys off to school and to colleges in different parts of this country. And yet still, we've got to have these conversations to ensure that no matter what, our kids come back home. Organizationally, I think we are processing um, based on how, on what we were created to do. Uh, we have uh, My Brother's Keeper, which is run and has always been headed by Rabbi Solomon Schiff, which is an interfaith group um, through the Community Relations Board to answer to these types of things, particularly around hate speech and anti-Semitism and a lot of what we're seeing. The CRB really deals with, um, you know, a lot of the police uh, police involved shootings, a lot of the gun violence, and we understand that there is definitely a role to be played. This board is um, 26 community members serve on this board, 13 members of which are appointed by a commission and 13 members are at large. We are represented by many faith leaders. We are represented by um, many community leaders that represent some of the largest institutions in this community. But none of that matters unless we understand the role that we all play. And I think for me, one of the best that has come out of this is one, the ability to realize that together we are stronger than independently. The other strength that I think has come out of this with a passion that I have for young people is to see that many of these protests that have been planned have really been planned by young people under the age of 21. And that gives us heart because it says that the work of the NAACP, the, the work of the Urban League, the work that agencies like this have done have not fallen afraid. In fact, the work continues and it continues strong with young people who understand it and young people who see value in this work. This generation is saying no more. This generation is saying enough is enough. And this generation is saying there is value in each and every one of our lives. So if I were to navigate how we move forward, I think one of the things that I would definitely want to say, it begins not with just trying to establish the solution, but all of us sitting and listening and really trying to empathize and humanize with the lived experiences of Black Americans in this country. It is no, it is not just in history books. We need to understand what that means and the value that comes out of that. I think what we have been able to do, we have personally monitored well over 20 protests. I have personally marched 10 of them in partnership with the Miami-Dade police department through an MOU that we have, really wanting to create that catalyst between the community and law enforcement. And we understand it isn't a job that's going to happen overnight because NAACP has been doing it for a while. But again, I say I am truly honored to be in the position to, to lead a board that is willing to do this work. And uh, I extend my sincere appreciation and gratitude for the friendship of the Federation. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Shirley. That, that was wonderful. Uh, Sherry Tzvi, um, our friend from ADL, um, who, who lives and breathes and, and, and works in, in these fields all the time. We'd love to hear from you, Sherry. Thank you so much for having me, Jacob. I'm honored to be on a panel with such unbelievable community partners. And I'm, I'm honored to be here tonight representing ADL. Um, reflecting on a personal level, I was horrified uh, by the murder of George Floyd. And it was one that came after so many other senseless deaths. And it wasn't a murder, it was a lynching. And we witnessed it for nine minutes. And my kids have been watching it on TV. And it's hard. And this weekend we learned the name Richard Brooks. And we're just seeing a horrible succession of crime against the black community. And to not be moved is to be complicit with the ongoing issues um, that are reflecting the black community in this country. And as Shirley said, enough is enough. And as you said, Jacob, I'm the granddaughter of four Holocaust survivors. And I grew up hearing about how they watched the murders of their families, my family, at the hands of the Nazis, the police, their neighbors. And these lessons teach us what happens when hate goes unchecked. And, and they remind me of the words of Pastor Martin Niemöller, which are on the wall as you leave the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's permanent exhibition. And the last piece is, you know, there was no one left to speak for me. So where were my great grandparents, neighbors, their teachers, their partners, their allies? 
we need to be those allies. Many white progressives think that they don't have an issue with race because the comparison is to those who espouse overt racism from the right. But explicit bias doesn't take hold without sustained implicit bias. And it's not enough to say that you stand with the black community. We have to commit ourselves to learn how we arrived at this situation today. We need to understand the experience of others. My regional board chair, Tracy Labgold, who I love and who is on this call, and who many of you know, uh, she suggested to the board that they read a book and that we have a discussion about White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo, which I recommend to everyone if you haven't read it. And it's a first step in our reflecting and educating ourselves because I'm going to participate because I recognize I have my own work to do. And so I will be participating in that um, with my board. Organizationally, you know, ADL, for those who don't know, we have a 107 year old mission. And it's to stop the defamation of the Jewish people, but also to secure justice and fair treatment to all. And we're committed to fighting racism, hate, anti-Semitism, of course, and to resist bigotry in all forms because we wanna build the kind of society that we wanna see for our children and for our grandchildren. And if we wanna create a society that's true to ADL's values and our mission, we have to stand strong and steadfast with the black community. We can't leave this space. This is a crucial time to call leadership to action. It's a crucial time to offer ourselves as allies. And it's a time for self and organizational reflection on how we can be better. My team and the entire organization recognize it's time to listen and learn and act. And in terms of what I see that's coming out of the community, I mean, ultimately it should not have taken murders for us to get here or a list of people who have been murdered and targeted, but here we are. Um, and it's created an opportunity to do a deep dive into issues of race and bias. And so many are struggling to find solutions here. But I think that's because we're at a flashpoint and we're beyond implicit bias here. The current situation has really galvanized the community in a way that we haven't seen in years. And it's allowed people to generate solutions to work together uh, to make our country more inclusive. So we have people who are reaching out to ADL for our educational resources. They're going to our website for anti-bias resources and table talk conversations. And we have a webinar coming up next week on how parents should, it can, not only parents, but how people can talk to youth about racism. Uh, and nationally, we're working in our 25 regional offices and our national office with the NAACP and our other partners in the black community. And um, we're seeing efforts to really change policy. And you know, there's House Resolution 988, Jacob, I can put a link in the chat if you want to share that later, um, which is um, a House resolution, as I said, 988, to condemn all acts of police brutality, and racial profiling and the use of excessive militarized force. And it's something that ADL is standing behind and we have on our website as something that people can act to do. Moving forward, um, you know, we're, we're entering uh, what will be a very different type of political season. And we're a 501c3, so we don't rate or endorse candidates, but what I will say is that every level, leaders need to lead. They need to lead by example, and they need to call out hate in every form, whenever they see it. And that's the end of that. Our litmus test has to be that our communities are not divided by horrible slogans or appeals to bigotry. We, we have our, our litmus test our litmus test has to be that we're standing together against hate so that when protests stop and they're not in the headlines, it, our work doesn't end. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for your great work uh, all, all, the, all the time. Just, just, just wonderful. 
Um, next, I'd like to ask um, our newest friend, Alvi Thompson, um, to um, respond to, to uh, the questions. Um, we're all interested to hear the words of a coach. Well, first off, I really appreciate you all having me on this platform and creating this space where we can all come together so we can learn, educate, and find tangible ways to move forward and be allies and how we're going to create change in the Black community, the country, and the world at large. To be honest, going through these last almost three weeks now since George Floyd died has brought about so many different emotions in me. It started with anger, then sadness, then hopelessness, all because of this it almost seems like on a yearly basis, you know, the same type of stories come up and the same type of things happen. And over time, um, really resonated what Ruben said in terms of getting to this space of acceptance, where I currently understand where we are now. And it's all about how can I personally help make a difference going forward. And it, it's so interesting because I think George Floyd's death was really this tipping point that's allowed us to have the conversations that we're having now. Um, like it was touched on earlier by many of you, we're now having these difficult conversations that needed to be happening for decades, if not hundreds of years before this. So now that we're in this space where we can come together, to me, it is all about, okay, what are the solutions going forward? What I'll say is one of the silver linings that I've seen in this whole situation is that so many of us are rallying together to create the change, whether it's through conversations with family and loved ones, it's conversations like we're having right now as a group and conversations that people are having at all levels is gonna be so important. And something that I would love all of us to keep in mind is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, This is gonna be something that we get to work on not just for the rest of 2020, but for the decades to come to ensure that we're not having this same conversation 10, 20, 30 years from now. And in order for that to happen, I think what we all get to do is see how are we a part of the current system that's going on right now? How individually are each of us a reason how certain implicit racism, you know, social injustice and things like that always happen? I've read something amazing and I'll, I'll put this in the chat or have a way to send this out, but there's a great resource called whenwestandtogether.com. And I was reading uh, El Glenise Pike put together a form on anti-racism. And she talks about this four part process of how we can actually grow and become anti-racist and really be active in this process. And a lot of it resonated with my work as a coach the first stage she spoke about is awareness and it's understanding, which I make up that all of us understand because we're all here right now, that there is a problem going on, that things aren't right and there's a lot that gets to change. And then from there, step two is education. It's not only what's going on currently, but how did we get to this point? You know, starting way back 400 years ago, from slavery and then going into Jim Crow and then into mass incarceration and then into different forms that we see now. So the more educated we are, the more that we can actually see how this became a problem and now we can create solutions going forward. And then the third stage, which I think is the most important right here, right now, is the stage she talks about self-interrogation. And it's really asking ourselves the tough questions of how am I individually uh, perpetuating what's going on in the world. What type of beliefs do I have? What type of actions have I taken? What type of things have I let slide? Have I sat on the sidelines in the past? And once we do these, these really tough questions and we go through that process and we see how we're showing up as individuals, then we can really create change going forward. Because in my philosophy, it's really all about starting at the individual level. And then as all of us as individuals come together and we form a collective, as we spoke of earlier today, there's so much power in numbers and that's what we're seeing now. So my invitation would be for everybody to see how do they perpetuate what's going on and how we got up to this point and do it from a place not of 
being wrong or bad or placing blame or guilting yourself, but just from a matter of fact and, and a matter of understanding so that we can move forward. And then the last part is community action. She speaks about how important it is for all of us as a community to take all of these things that we're learning and helping educate others. And I believe that's what we're doing right now by holding this space and having over 250 people here together looking at what the solutions are going to be going forward because I'm really hopeful that we're going to be able to create it. And it really starts with all of us at individual levels and doing this type of work that we're doing right here. So I'm really grateful to be in this space and I'm really happy that everyone's here looking to be a part of the change. Thank you very much, Alvi. That, that, was, that was great. And, and uh, I, I love your action steps at, at, at the end. I, I think it's wonderful. So I've gotten um, a, a ton of questions, uh, as, as I predicted, because of the quality of your presentation. So uh, a lot of people have, have, have a lot to say. Um, may, maybe there, there, there is an issue on the table. And I think I'd like to maybe just deal with it uh, first. Um, um, but it's something that, from my point of view, keeps the Jewish community from from like being all in with the Black Lives Matter. And, and it's because I think from a values point of view, uh, protesting the innocent loss of life, the murder of people by, uh, by others with authority um, it, it is, is reprehensible. Um, I think you all know uh, that part of the Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives, includes some pretty uh, rough uh, language about Israel. And frankly, we, we consider it anti-Semitic, and I think most people do. Um, I also know from my friends in, in, in the movement that very, very few people involved in Black Lives Matter even know that, they, that it's there, much less uh, believe it. Um, but I, I wonder, maybe Sherry, you would start because I know ADL has worked on this issue. Uh, how, what advice would you give to Jews who want to display and be strong allies uh, for this? And how, how should we be dealing with those, um, th those dissonant um, and minority voices in the movement that, that we struggle with? Uh, so first and foremost, just a couple of words about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, it was created in response to racist incidents and the murder of Trayvon Martin several years ago. And it was really intended from our understanding to create an online community to combat anti-Black racism. And then a loose organization was formed and they released a platform that addressed core issues of the movement and some of the people who supported BDS used the creation of the movement as an opportunity to include international issues. And the platform included clearly anti-Israel and pro-BDS content, no mistake. But that platform has been removed. And you know, not every organization within the Black community signed onto that platform, in fact. But Black Lives Matter is a movement. It's not a structured organization. And there may be individuals associated with it, which we obviously, obviously, have disagreements with, but it's not a reason not to support the overarching critical message and goals of the movement. And especially in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, we're seeing Black Lives Matter protests galvanizing countless Americans and others across racial divides, regardless of religion, regardless of your politics and where you sit, regardless of any of that. Most important really are the, the concerns that are raised by those supporting Black Lives Matter and this movement. They're critical civil rights issues, uh, particularly in the criminal justice system and in response to murders by police or the use of excessive force against Black people and other communities of color. And the hashtag conveys that sentiment. And ADL will always raise our voices and expressly say that Black lives do matter and we support the Black community in their fight for justice and ending systemic racism. So I hope that helps. Thank you, it, it, it sure does. And I think, I think it's an important message for people to hear. I know a lot of people are struggling with that and I think you've given us a great, a great way to, to, to think about it. 
Ruben, uh, the next question is 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 coming to you. I'm 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 actually uh, putting it to you. It was a general question, um, but but um, someone is asking about microaggression and intersectionality. Um, would you give us a little tutorial on what those means? And if you can, if you don't mind, maybe reflect on on it from a personal point of view. So uh, microaggression, wow. Um, I want you to put yourself in a place where um, you are a, see yourself as a young black female and someone who is not black comes to you and say, well, you're, you're beautiful for a black girl. And think about it from that perspective of being the black woman or girl. And you feel that, okay, my beauty has some criteria or qualifications to it. I just can't be beautiful alone. I have to be beautiful for a black girl which means that there's some limitations there, or it sounds as if there's some limitations. That is an example of a microaggression. Uh, that's an example of how, uh, whether it's intentional or unintentional, something is said um, that may have been meant to be uh, flattering, but it has an undertone to it, uh, you know, uh, that, that may be racially motivated or, or that sort of thing. And that's the life of, um, of uh, a lot of Black people. I'd say most Black people. We're often told, uh, you know, or oh, if you speak a certain way, uh, <laughs> you, you, you sound, you sound uh, from the Black community you hear, you sound white. Uh, from the white community you hear, well, wow, you, you speak well. You know, as if, you know, that should not be the case. Those are all signs of uh, uh, microaggression. So when you look at um, what you experience, what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, that's something that we're constantly, our value is constantly being presented to us from an assessment st uh, standpoint. You know, how, how are you valued? How are you viewed? How are you seen? And that's something that is, uh, think about that. Think, it, think about it if you were living your life on a daily basis and you feel that you're constantly being assessed and not by what you have to offer. Uh, it really comes with the initial presence of who you are. I can't, I can't come out of my skin. The, the first thing you see is me. I'm a large black man. Uh, so whatever images you conjure up in terms of what it means to be, uh, you know, this large black man, whatever, whatever your fantasy is, whatever experience or whatever you were exposed to, whether it be bad or good or what have you, you, you have, society has conditioned uh, its members to view uh, people according to the, the, the social standards that we place. And so um, that's where the difficulty lies for us in terms of, of the um, in terms of the microaggressions. I want to take a moment. I know I have another question to answer, but I want to take a moment because I did I was I was remiss in not saying uh, this early in terms of some of the work that we've done from an organizational perspective. So NAACP has put out a statement and we work on, uh, we're working on criminal justice reform, educational reform, uh, economic justice, and also uh, housing, uh, affordable housing for all. And from the standpoint for the criminal justice reform, I'm glad to report that the uh, first reading of the citizens, um, uh, oversight board that they have for the county pass uh, by nine to four. So we're going into the second reading in July. We strongly ask for your support uh, for the police oversight. Uh, it's the C Citizens Investigative Panel, CIP is what it's gonna be called, but that uh, something that we would like. We, it was formally in place as the IRP, 
and 2008 is it, it was uh, defunded and now we're asking for it to be uh, funded again. So that and in terms of intersectionality, you're talking about two um, issues uh, uh, colliding, and if you will, not colliding with working together or whatever. You're working with two particular issues, if you will. And when you think about the intersection of something, we, we can talk about how our two communities are working together, intersectionality. We can talk about how the youth and the older folks are working together in terms of the protests. We can talk about those types of things and how uh, the importance of having that convergence, how the importance of having, uh, that's what it means to me, how the, the importance of making sure that we, uh, uh, those communities or uh, how they intersect and how they work together, uh, the importance of having those uh, communities work together in the case of this protesting, as, as you, as it were, and working together to make sure that we can achieve a common goal. So you can have that interplay between uh, two groups, uh, two issues, and they combine and come together to work towards achieving a common goal. And this is something that I'm seeing more of as we play this out on a daily basis with the protests, with agencies you talked about, for example, Black Lives Matter. So you want to know how does the Jewish Federation, how does Black Lives Matter, how do you work together when there seemingly is some sort of issues uh, about a statement that was made. And I think that one of the things that we really need to look at is that uh, sometimes there may be some issues with parts of an organization or an entity that may not be fully formed or operational in, 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 a, in an organized way. Uh, but its purpose and, and its intent means well. We, uh, African American and Jewish people, our histories are aligned. We are we come from an oppression. Uh, we come from uh, an oppressed people. If you go back to um, the uh, Jewish people leaving Egypt, their exodus, and what we're experiencing now is an exodus of sorts. 419, 401 years uh, since the first slave was brought over. And now we're getting to a point to where we're really, really addressing these issues. We've been addressing them along, along the way, but we're addressing the issues collectively. And I think that this is something uh, that speaks to that whole issue of intersectionality. I'm sorry if I took too Thank long. you. That was, that was helpful. Thank you very much, Ruben. Uh, Shirley, um, the, the, next, uh, the next question I wanna ask you, and, uh, Talk about police uh, with us, please. Uh, law enforcement, um, you know, uh, to, to be very honest, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish community has developed very close relationships with law enforcement. We're grateful to them for their, their support, their protection uh, about anti-Semitic uh, shooting, terror, et cetera. Uh, by the same token, you know, we, we uh, have, have no trouble identifying when, when, when police have acted wrong. I think a lot of people want to hear that um, it's just a few bad cops, you know, doing bad things, but that overall that law enforcement is, is uh, ra racially evolved and, and, and uh, politically sensitive and, and, and great human beings who want to serve and protect. Um, how, how do you understand uh, the reality? You know, uh, criminal justice reform is critically important. Um, uh, help us to understand it through your eyes. What, what do you think is necessary? How do you view the whole situation? And how would you encourage us to think about it? So I think one of the things that we have to be mindful of when we're talking about, when we talk about policing is the history, right? The epidemiology of what, where did policing come from? Um, and we have to realize that policing actually took place in this country right after slaves, you know, right after the slaves landed here and they began to get some of their freedom and we felt the need that they needed to be policed. And that's of course in short. But I also think um, from the perspective of the community relations board, I know that when I took over in 2016, one of the very first things that I fully understood is that law enforcement and community could not reside in the same space unless there was actual space for open dialogue. And one of the very first things that I worked on was a memorandum of understanding between the Community Relations Board and the Miami-Dade Police Department 
um, really saying in the spaces and in the cases where there was a controversial shooting or in the case where the community was asking for, you know, attention was arising, that it would not just be the Miami-Dade Police Department addressing it, but this board of 26 leaders in this community could come together with the police department and the community and serve as an intermediary. As such, we created what, well, we, we didn't really create it because the committee had already existed, which is the Criminal Justice and Law Enforcement Committee. What we have done, however, is created this safe space for community to bring their concerns. And law enforcement will tell you, I'm the first one to get on them when they're wrong, uh, whether it be Miami-Dade PD, we have done it during the Dime Loving case. We've done it with Biscayne Park in the situation with the, um, the, the, racist, the racist police officer and the racist chiefs that were blaming all the robberies on the black people in the community. We've done it with the city of Miami Beach holding them accountable during Memorial Day weekend and the list goes on. So for me, I understand fully that there was a role for law enforcement to play. And the only way that this works, and I think Ruben said it best, the only way that this works is really the intersectionality. Law enforcement needs to understand that there is a role for community and it has to be, it has to be hand in hand. That's number one. Number two, when we talk about the criminal justice reform, we have to be very mindful. I think the role that many entities and many organizations have come together to get the IRP refunded for the oversight is a necessity. As long as that's what the community wants and the community feels that that is what is a necessity and clearly we see that that is one of the many the many reforms that are being asked around the country, right? As we've seen the, the ban on chokeholds and all of that. But one of the things that I also want us to be very mindful of to not lose sight is that law enforcement, the police department is only the opening part to criminal justice. So we need to be very mindful of who our state attorneys are. We need to be mindful of who's prosecuting, right? Who's, who are the public defenders? Who are the judges that we're putting in place? The corrections, parole, um, the, the bail system. So the system itself, we cannot just completely look at just policing as though policing is going to take care of the rest of the system. So the same issues and reform that we are asking, basically demanding, because we see what it has caused us thus far, 401 years, we need to be applying those same pressures and systems across the board, because at the end of the day, once, though, once you get into the jail, once you get into the charging, you get past the A form, you get, who's processing? You know, are black men and black cases being put at the bottom because the public defender never bothered to look at it until the day of? Are black cases being pleaded out more than going to trial? So there is a lot for us to think about when we talk about criminal justice reform. And I think Alvi said it blessed when he said, this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. So yes, we're starting right now with the police department, but I think the intersectionality and the work that needs to be done if we're really talking about reform is, and clearly the ACLU did a report maybe a year and a half, two years ago, saying very clearly that the criminal justice system, not just the police department, but the criminal justice system in Miami-Dade was clearly racist to black and brown men, period. So therefore, if we're going to rely on that, as on that report from the ACLU, which is a phenomenal report, I know that we have called um, um, public defender Carlos Martinez to the table. We've called um, a state attorney, Catherine Rundle, to the table. What are we doing and how do we remedy some of these ills? Because this is the beginning of the conversation, but the tail end of the conversation also comes down to whom we elect as judges, whom we elect as elected officials to hold these people accountable because accountability and transparency is really what's going to make a difference when it comes to reforming the entire criminal justice system. Thank, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, John Stewart, who a lot of millennials think of as a, as a brilliant philosopher and pundit, I agree, actually. Uh, he talked about in his interview today in the Times that the police are just a part of society and they reflect the values of society. And when there's ingrained racism in society, the police are going are going to are going to reflect that, and and I, I think there's a lot of merit to that to that point of view as well. Alvi, uh, before um, we get into uh, our, our conversation about resources that are available to the community, I wonder if 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 it's okay, I would ask you to reflect on your experience as a Jew of color. Like, what's it been like for you as you uh, try to enter the Jewish community? There was a piece in the press today, the Anglo-Jewish press today, written by. Uh, a black Jewish rabbi who said that he's never been questioned, he's never failed to be questioned trying to participate in a Jewish event. 
and, uh, and, and, and that's a rabbi. Uh, I, I wonder, it, I think it might be enlightening and helpful for us to hear a little bit about your experience as a Jew of color. Yeah, so being a Jew of color has been an interesting and enlightening spirit or experience for me. It, it was interesting because growing up, my dad's a black American, my mom is a white Ashkenazi Jewish woman. And growing up, we, I grew up with just my mom. My dad wasn't really in the picture as I was growing up. And my mom never made it a real point to teach my brother and I about Judaism and the culture and everything like that. We went to some, you know, family bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, but we were never entrenched in the real culture and what it looks like. So I was very lucky last year to go on my birthright trip and really learn about everything that Israel is about. And it's been interesting for me to fast forward a year later, see myself in the Jewish space more often. And to be honest, I feel very welcomed which I'm very grateful for. And at the same time, there's still discomfort for me being in a space where I am the only person of color or even just the only black man. And that's not to say that, you know, there aren't more black Jews out there, but I don't know of any real spaces that bring us together. And part of that is on my own ignorance and not knowing where those spaces are. I'm sure they are existing. However, it's been interesting to navigate during this time because first and foremost, I look at myself as a black man and that's how I experience myself based off of the way I look and how others see me. To move forward, you know, one of my biggest goals is to really bridge the gap in many of the similarities and the differences that I see in the black community and the Jewish community. Um, oftentimes, you know, the Jewish community is seen as a group of people who are really there for each other all the time in all situations and they show up powerfully for each other. And in my experience, you know, more so in the black community, there's just been so many different things, whether it's been conditioned, whether it's through media or just my own personal experience that have kind of been there to, to divide us. And it's interesting. It shows up in different ways and just the way, a light skin and a, and a dark skin black person might make a joke about each other. And it's those own microaggressions that we use on each other that we didn't even realize was even a thing. And now that I'm a 31 year old man and I can look back on, you know, my teenage years and even my college years, and I can see how much was instilled in me subconsciously that I had no idea about. And I think what's going to be really important going forward is not only creating a, a space for black Jews, but creating a space for black Jews, white Jews, black people of all different religions to come together and really be allies in this going forward. And I'm in a really fortunate position where I have been exposed to a lot of different cultures. I have friends and family members of all different cultures. So they do feel, whatever the word is comfortable, safe, whatever word you want to use to come to me and to have those discussions with me. And I realize that there's people who are black that have never interacted with white people before. I understand that there are white people who have never interacted with black people before. And that was very much the case when I was at Georgetown, I was playing football there. I had white teammates who you know, went to private school, boarding school, and their only perception of black people came from the media, whether it's through sports, whether it's through music, you know, the arts, whatever it may be, that's all they know of. And then on the other side, when it comes to some of the black people that grew up in underprivileged neighborhoods and, you know, they had the privilege to go to an institution like Georgetown. And it was this complete culture shock for them as well, because they have no idea what, what white people do or what they're about or what happens. And they have their own stereotypes as well. So what I think is important going forward is that at the end of the day, we all realize that we're humans and that we're in this together and that race is a socially made construct. Like it was literally made up in order to create a system in a tier of saying, hey, one person's better than the other. And a lot of those systems are still in place today. We don't even realize it. So going forward, I mean, you know, my experience as a black Jew, I'm so, I'm so grateful for it. And I realize that I have so much to learn about both communities, the black community and the Jewish community, because it is so deep, it is so nuanced. And at the end of the day, we have so many more commonalities than differences. 
that if we can focus on our core values that we have in common, I mean, we can transcend this whole thing just with these two communities. So that's where I am now with it. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective with us. You're, you're, uh, <laughs> you're the, the, the Jews are like, um, we need every, every, every Jew we can find. So you are, you are very welcome and you, you don't just have a lot to learn. You've got a lot to offer and we're grateful <laughs> to have you part of the, uh, part of the community. So we're going to move to wrap up now. Um, uh, we, we have, a, a Carol Brick Turin, my, my colleague who's the head of the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council is going to, walk us through a really important presentation of, of resources that are available for learning, for doing, um, and, and, and for moving the ball forward. And then I have a very brief 40-second um, wrap-up. So please stay with us, and, and we'll be done in, in five or six minutes. So Carol, thanks for your work in putting this together, and your work all the time in advancing this issue on our behalf. Thank you so much, Jacob. And of course, Alvi, Rubin, Shirley, Sherry, I'm so grateful to each of you as a friend and a colleague for first of all, saying yes without hesitation to joining us tonight. And especially for sharing your vulnerabilities and your hope. We have these conversations on an ongoing basis several times a week and we have for years and our hearts break at the stories that underlie the suffering. It's so clear from tonight's discussion that the discrimination and bigotry from which our country is reeling, including the most recent tragedies, are so, so very important to each of you. We all know that we're strongest when we work in partnership, that together we must jointly address the deeply entrenched and systemic racism and prejudices in our world. For those of you joining us this evening who might not be familiar with our Federation's Jewish Community Relations Council or JCRC, chaired so well by Tracy Spiegelman, we are Federation's public policy and advocacy arm. We build bridges and meaningful, authentic relationships between the Jewish community and other faith, ethnic, political, and civic groups to work in common cause. Against a backdrop of a continued rise in anti-Semitism and deep concerns about Jewish communal security, recent events are a stark reminder that we must together stand up and speak out about all the isms and phobias, racism, Islamophobia, homophobia, xenophobia, collaborating with other communities who share our mission, vision, and goals. The work of our living, of the work of living our values in the broader civic space is crucial and it's ongoing. Leaning into the vulnerabilities that each of our communities feels while amplifying the work and hope of their friends, allies, and partners, fostering understanding and promoting mutual respect. We are again reminded that we must listen to and lift up the voices of Jews of color. During this time of unprecedented challenges in addressing racism, there are no easy answers, but there is much that we can do. Our JCRC will continue to build consensus within the organized Jewish community in order to amplify our united voice in the public sphere. We will serve as a convener of individuals and organizations to stand up and speak out, as well as a coalition partner with our ethnic and civic colleagues, clergy members, and elected officials. And we will model civil discourse, finding common ground within a broad range of opinions and ideology through constructive dialogue. Finally, serve the community as a trusted resource. In short, we will continue to engage, educate, and act. And so allow me to provide a call to action in confronting systemic racism. To effect meaningful change in ourselves, our institutions, and our society, each of us has a responsibility to educate ourselves about the personal narrative of those impacted by racism. We need to acknowledge our own prejudices and do the difficult work to address our implicit biases. We need to show up and stand in solidarity supporting the Black community. We need to speak out by condemning racist statements and actions whenever and wherever they occur in public or in private. And we need to advocate for social justice with elected officials through visits and phone calls, letters, emails, and social media. We need to complete the 2020 census that not only determines our represent representation in the US Congress, but the flow of government dollars to our county. The census can be filled out by phone, by mail, or online. And finally, vote. Please vote in national, state, 
and local elections where authorities have control over the systems that most impact our daily lives. And remember, not all elections take place in November. So please look to August elections as well. In wrapping up and to facilitate the first step, education. Our JCRC has compiled a compendium of resources on racial justice housed on our website and accessed with the URL on your screen, jewishmiami.org backslash JCRC resources. It will be continually updated. We provide articles and books to read, podcasts to listen to and videos to watch. Included are resources for educators, students and parents. And there is a section devoted entirely to Jews of color. The compilation is meant as a broad, diverse and inclusive list which reflects points of view and perspectives as well as organization analyses on racial justice. And we have also posted on the same URL an election guide and our call to action. And so let me finish by again thanking Alvi, Shirley, Ruben and Sherry. Our relationships inspire me and sustain me. I appreciate you. Jacob, take it away. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you uh, for, to all the panelists. Thank you to our, our participants. I, I just want to close with a, a, a couple of teachings. Um, I, I am one of those Jews who thinks wistfully and longingly back to the days when Jews and African Americans worked very closely together on, on issues of social justice, on issues that hurt each other um, so that we could provide a solace, consolation, and strength to each other. Um, the relationship that I think of as being paradigmatic in that regard is the one that was shared by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, two of my heroes. Um, and, and, and I'll just share two quotations, uh, one from each of them. Um, they, they were friends, they had an intimate relationship, they were spiritual giants, and they were social activists non pareil. Martin Luther King, of course, said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And some people say, well, it doesn't bend by itself. Uh, it bends because we have to be God's hands in making sure that we are bending that arc toward moral justice. And then there's the line that Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said in his diary, he wrote, after returning from the Voting Rights March in Selma in, in March of uh, 1965, uh, he wrote in his diary, he said, I felt my legs were praying. So marching together with Reverend King, he knew that his legs were doing God's work. So together, together, we have to bend the arc of the moral universe uh, toward, toward justice. We have to take responsibility for being God's partner in that enterprise. And as it says in, in Leviticus, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, righteousness, justice, uh, you shall pursue it. It doesn't happen by itself. It's up to us to pursue it. So thank you all very, very much for participating. God bless you and let's be strong and strengthen one another.